Most timelines have a Rick, and most Ricks have a Morty. This place is a real who's who of who's you and me. This is Rick and Morty. And this is Rick and Morty. This is Rick, this is also Rick, and this is Morty. On any given episode of Rick and Morty, a viewer can expect a pretty wild, crass, and mind-bending delve into a world of rich, multiversal science fiction. There are many contenders for what the perfect episode of Rick and Morty should be. You could argue that Total Recall was the best singular plotline of the series. You could also argue that the Rick Shank redemption is structurally solid, complete with twists and turns that feel natural to these characters. The writing of Rick and Morty is almost too smart for its own good sometimes. Justin Roiland and Dan Harmon have an access to a pool of writers that have since gone on to develop a lot of Marvel properties. Tom Kaufman writes for Loki, Jessica Gao is writing She-Hulk, and Jeff Loveness is writing the next installment of Ant-Man and the Wasp. A big part of what makes Rick and Morty so successful is how these brilliant writers exercise their uncanny ability to synthesize disparate and wildly unexpected creative influences into the show. They borrow from all the right places, and the episode we're focusing on today is a perfect example of that. We're talking, of course, about the 2018 Annie Award-winning Season 3 episode titled The Ricklantis Mix-Up. Rick and Morty exploded into the mainstream back in 2013 and was an instant success. Since then, the show has developed a rabid fan base and was so popular at one point, they were able to get McDonald's to re-release a dipping sauce that hadn't been on the menu for over a decade. The pathway to getting Rick and Morty made was paved by a legal complaint from Bill Cosby and the subsequent cancellation over his awkwardly hilarious 2005 animated series, House of Cosby's. Cosby's 1 and 5 have to use the bathroom too. You've been in there all day, okay? You're pissing me off! In 2006, Justin Roiland would ruffle some more feathers with the release of The Real Adventures of Doc and Marty, which was a direct parody of Back to the Future. I'm so sad! Don't be sad, Marty. We'll go back in time, and we'll make sure that your kite doesn't get stuck in the tree. Somehow, Dan Harmon saw this and said, hey, Let's turn this into one of the most successful animated shows of all time. And thus, Rick and Morty was born. The genius of the Rick Lantis mix-up wouldn't be possible to achieve without the incredibly solid setup work done in the show's first season. Brick by brick, Rick and Morty slowly built itself around the idea of a multiverse. And the multiverse came with its own sort of meta plotline that the writers occasionally tap into throughout the series to inject a little drama into this overly ridiculous world of science fiction. Season 1 introduces us to the Council of Ricks. The idea pulls largely from the Marvel comics Council of Reeds, which first appeared in the 2009 run of Fantastic Four as a multi-dimensional judgment board made up of different variants of Mr. Fantastic himself, Reed Richards. This episode not only introduces us to the concept of endless variations of Rick and Morty existing in the same place at the same time, it also introduces us to the concept of there being an evil Morty. There's a sort of sliding scale that some fans of the show, and even Rick himself, use to describe these Ricks and Mortys. On that scale, our primary characters from Dimension C-137 believe to be the Rickest Rick and the Mortiest Morty in every conceivable universe. The Mortiest Morty! Just don't get too big for your loafers, Buster Brown! Using this arbitrary scale, some fans refer to Evil Morty as the Rickest Morty in existence, while any other Ricks and Mortys all fall in line somewhere along that scale. Doing this much work early on in the series effectively grounds an incredibly lofty concept. Establishing the rules of an entire space-time continuum is not what we would refer to as a simple task, but these incredibly smart writers are able to deliver something concise and easy to follow very early on in the show's run. Wubba lubba dub dub! We have lots more Rick and Morty to discuss, but before we get there, I want to talk about Private Internet Access, the world's most transparent VPN and the sponsor of this video. As someone who is obviously obsessed with film and TV, what I like most about private internet access is that it works with all major streaming services, so you can have unrestricted access to all your favorite content anywhere in the world. Plus, private internet access is available for all platforms, Windows, Mac OS, Android, you name it. Their VPN is 100% open source and their code is public, so anyone can take a look under the hood and clearly see just how private their service really is. Hey, they're not known as the most transparent VPN in the world for nothing. Right now, if you use my link, you can get increased digital privacy for less than $2 a month. If you sign up for a three-year subscription, you get four extra free months for only $1.98 a month. That's 83% off. There's a 30-day money-back guarantee that you can use as a risk-free trial, so you really have nothing to lose. And now, back to the video. 
The Bricklantis mix-up begins with a pretty classic Rick and Morty setup. It's Rick and Morty gearing up for an underwater adventure. You ready for our adventure to the lost city of Atlantis? Ready as I'll ever be, Rick! Oh, for f***'s sake. They are visited by another Rick and another Morty, who ask them if they'd like to donate to the rebuilding of the Citadel, over which the original Council of Ricks presided. After plenty of self-referential humor, Rick and Morty go off on their underwater adventure, and we are treated to this extremely important opening image to the real title of the episode, Tales from the Citadel. This opening title sequence does an incredible amount of heavy lifting as far as setups go. Set to Joe Walsh's 1979 classic song, In the City, which some of you might recognize from being the closing song to The Warriors, these 45 seconds of non-speaking action introduce and set up each one of the episode's extremely important characters. We have campaign manager Morty hailing a cab, Cadet Rick completing some weapons training, the Morty Academy students heading off to class for the first time, and finally, this sort of blue-collar Rick heading to work on a bus. This series of images is an extremely concise setup for what is about to transpire for the duration of the episode. It's a good example of a concept that we talk about from time to time, which is show, don't tell. The writers are showing us things that we should care about as opposed to telling us why we should care. There is a quote here that Steve Jobs is famous for misattributing to Pablo Picasso. Idiots create, geniuses steal. This is actually a T.S. Eliot quote and it reads, immature poets imitate, mature poets steal. That's sort of what Justin Roiland does here with these plot threads. He effectively steals tropes and maps them over the Rick and Morty multiverse. The first being a high stakes political campaign, akin to let's just say the Manchurian candidate. This plot line is introduced first because it serves as a backdrop for the other three plot lines to operate under. The next established plot line is facilitated through a nice segue of Morty celebrating their candidate of choice. The camera hones in on Cadet Rick sipping coffee and waiting for his new partner to show up. His new partner is a Morty who has been hardened by the criminal underworld, who is showing this new Rick how policing is done in the Citadel. This steals from films like Training Day or LA Confidential. What happened? Same old story. Morty's killing Morty's. Next, we're introduced to the Morty Academy and specifically these four Mortys who have become friends through their education process. This plotline steals from childhood coming-of-age stories, specifically the 1986 classic Stand By Me. And finally, the Blue Collar Rick storyline has all the makings of a film like the 1979 Academy Award-winning film Norma Ray. In borrowing slash stealing from these extremely recognizable tropes, the writers are able to generate story structure that resonates with the audience without doing very much work. These stories all feel familiar and recognizable. We can see snippets of these stories and our brains sort of fill in the blanks. What's this? It's secrets. What do you think it is? Look at how I'm dressed. After all these storylines have been established, all the writers really need to do is follow the very plot lines they're borrowing from. Politician Morty gets the upper hand during these debates. The students have this heart-to-heart -heart moment around the campfire on their way to the wishing portal. Blue Collar Rick murders his boss. And Cadet Rick is learning about the criminal underworld of Rickless Mortys. Even this moment where President Morty kills the Ricks who don't agree with him is pulled straight from the James Bond film, Thunderball. This all feels familiar because the writers have borrowed and leaned into the tropes they have borrowed from. The episode weaves not one, not two, not three, but four completely separate plot lines throughout a show that is already bursting at the seams with interdimensional chaos. The Rick Lantis mix-up is an homage to award-winning classics that uses brevity to its advantage. Every second of this episode is absolutely crucial to the entirety of the piece as a whole, reminding us that it's okay to borrow an idea, or two, or three, or four from time to time as long as it's done intentionally and from a fresh perspective. And with that being said, that is it for today's episode. You might see a couple of links floating in the window here, so feel free to click on those if you'd like to stick around. And hey, thanks for watching Nerdstalgic.